How can we improve communication at work? Are stock markets really efficient? Should we let algorithms make moral choices? How will climate migration affect our societies? The Chicago Booth Review podcast addresses the big questions in business, policy, and markets with insight from the world's leading academic researchers. We bring you groundbreaking research in a clear and straightforward way. It could help you make better decisions, work smarter, and maybe even become happier. Find us wherever you get your podcasts. We all know that eating healthy is important, but in practice... Well, that's much harder to do. They're chocolatey with crisp baked wafers and crunchy peanuts sprinkled on top. A rich chocolate with a touch of orange flavor you rack and unwrap. Marshmallows and chocolate graham crackers together. Are you craving sweets yet? Startling new insight into the addictive power of sugary, salty, and fatty foods. Would you believe doctors have found that cravings for junk food may be as strong as an addiction to heroin or cocaine? These days, more sugar, artificial dyes, and preservatives are sneaking into our foods. So the question I have is, why are they so addictive? And some may ask, tasty. It's delicious. Yeah. It's no secret that these foods aren't good for us and the health implications are massive. Today, around 42% of adults in the U.S. are obese, and alarmingly, obesity is rising among children, too. In the U.S. right now, one in five kids are considered obese by doctors. But it's not just here. It's a global problem. Obesity has tripled since 1975. So, how did we wind up here? We live in an environment in which we are surrounded by messages to eat more. That's Marian Nessel, a professor of nutrition, food studies, and public health at New York University. She is famously, and infamously in some circles, known as one of the food industry's biggest critics. The whole purpose of a food company is to get people to eat more of its products. Public health experts are well aware of this fact, and yet it seems like our food environment has only gotten worse. I mean, the, the study has just come out saying that the cost of obesity and healthcare and lost productivity is going to amount to trillions of dollars, and it's going to affect every country in the world, and it's going to affect people's personal lives in not very nice ways. We don't have a health care system in the United States. How are people's health problems going to be paid for? Not easily. Welcome to Big Brains. On our show, we translate the biggest ideas and complex discoveries into digestible brain food. Big Brains, Little Bites from the University of Chicago Podcast Network. I'm your host, Paul Rand. On today's episode, the science of nutrition and food politics. I wonder if I can start off by maybe just getting you to talk about your training, your background, your education, because I think that is quite fundamental to how you approach the field of nutrition. I was a science, I was a bacteriology major in college and then went to graduate school in molecular biology. It was really fabulous training because you can't see what you're doing in molecular biology. You have to infer it from the kinds of experiments that you're doing. Everything is at the molecular level. The whole game in graduate school was to try to figure out what was wrong with everybody's experiments. And I didn't really get back to food until my first teaching job. I was at Brandeis University in the biology department teaching cell and molecular biology and got handed a nutrition course to teach. And so that kind of critical thinking that I was trained to do um, I was able to use when I started looking at nutrition research, which is so much easier to deal with than um, molecular biology. I, uh -huh. You know, and I tell the story in my memoir about a nutrition class that I had just been handed to teach. And so I went to the library and started reading these studies in nutrition, and I mean, tell the story about it. It was, it was an incredible experience because... The studies were done on six people who were incarcerated in one way or another. 
Um, and, you know, the famous one was the vitamin C study. The scurvy study, the right? The scurvy study in, uh, of vitamin C. And it was done in a prison, which you can't do anymore for ethical reasons. And during the study, two of the prisoners escaped. <laughs> and I thought, oh, this is not a well-controlled <laughs> clinical trial. <laughs> Well, one of the, one of the lines that that, that I, I read and I was quite impressed with, you said, I have been attacked lots of times for my opinions, but never on my science. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, you know, I, the science is there. These days, it's impossible to escape the bombardment of nutrition advice and quote unquote research. There are tons of diets and fads out there from gluten free to keto and vegan, paleo and this nutrient and this food and this diet type of diet and fat and this kind of fat and that kind of fat. It's hard to keep up with all of the new trends, but as a nutrition expert who has read it all, Nestle says it really comes down to a few simple guidelines. Dietary advice boils down to eat real food, which means not a lot of junk food. You know, maintain a reasonable body weight and eat lots of plants. I mean, that's all there is to it. It's changed a lot, though, hasn't it? I mean, if we look even back at the last 50 years or the, we look at the, you know, the food pyramid back in the 90s, I mean, it really keeps evolving and it seems to change constantly. Why is that? Well, I actually am, don't agree with that. Um, you don't? No, okay. I don't think nutrition advice has changed at all. In the 1950s, Ansel Keys and his wife, Margaret, wrote the first set of dietary guidelines for chronic disease prevention. The facts are simple. You know the chief killer of Americans is cardiovascular disease disorders and degeneration of the heart and blood vessels. Here are vital statistics. They show that this problem here in America is the worst in the world. And they say, eat less saturated fat, salt, and sugar, eat more fruits and vegetables, don't drink too much alcohol, get plenty of sleep. Now you tell me what's changed in that. All right, so that that's a really interesting, and you're right. That's the exact same thing we hear today. What are we not learning? With that straightforward, simple advice she gave, why in the world is the world getting more obese? What happened? I could tell you what happened. I've got an elaborate explanation for what happened beginning with the election of Reagan as president that changed everything in the United States. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Up until then, the percentage of obesity in the population was quite low. After 1980, it went up very rapidly. Genetics did not change in 1980. What changed was the food environment. What happened in 1980 with Reagan's election was that corporations were given a free hand. Um, and that free market ideology became the ideology that everybody accepted. It is my intention to curb the size and influence of the federal establishment and to demand recognition of the distinction between the powers granted to the federal government and those reserved to the states or to the people. By that time, food was already beginning to be enormously overproduced. All of the effort was to produce as much food as possible. The number of calories in the food supply from 1980 to 2000 went from an average of 3,200 a person per capita, men, women, little tiny babies, to 4,000. So there was an enormous increase in the amount of calories available in the food supply. There was also an enormous increase in the number of calories that people were eating. So portions went up. Food became available in places that it had never been sold before. Libraries, bookstores. And then people wonder why people were eating more. Well, people were eating plenty more calories. The number of calories in people's diets went up and people gained an average of 10 to 20 pounds. It's morning again in America. I had a doctoral student, Lisa Young, who did her dissertation on the change in sizes of portions from 1980 to 2000 and demonstrated um, that muffins, which in the early 1980s were mini muffins, are now you know, 600 to 800 calories, they're enormous. It's not intuitively obvious to understand that larger portions have more calories. If you think 
about it, um, it makes sense. But in in fact, humans don't react to portions that way. Um, And we could prove that by asking students in a class uh, how many calories were in an 8-ounce soft drink and how many calories were in a 64-ounce soft drink. And the students, you know, that, that's an eight times difference. Eight times 100 is 800. The average calories was 300. And, you know, these students are not that mathematically challenged. So <laughs> when she went back and asked students why, they just said 800 calories in a soft drink is impossible. So there's something about portion size that makes everybody think it's smaller than it is. Big gulp. Semlem's big drink for a big thirst. From the 1980s through the 1990s, soda consumption skyrocketed. At its peak in 1998, Americans were drinking 53 gallons of soda per capita. They go down really easily. Uh, You have no idea how much sugar there is in uh, sugar-sweetened beverages because the flavors hide the sweetness, so you you really don't realize how much sugar you're getting. And there's tons and tons of evidence that sugars in liquid form are absorbed rapidly, raise Mm. blood sugar and insulin levels, and do all kinds of bad things. But how do you guide people on how much is the right amount? Well, there are sort of general recommendations, and the general recommendation is 10% or less of, of total calorie intake. If you're on a 2,000 calorie diet, then that's 200 calories from sugar divided by four. So it's 50 grams a day, that's 12 teaspoons. The reason that sugar is a problem is because everybody loves it. They want every food they eat to be to taste sweet and they can't stop eating it. Something else changed in our food environment from the 1980s through today, and it may be the worst offender when it comes to our public health crisis, processed foods. We love ultra-processed foods because they're designed to be irresistibly delicious. You can't eat just one. Ultra-processed foods make up more than half of all the calories in the U.S. diet. And I know that sounds scary, and I don't even know why. But <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, the classic example that's used to explain what ultra-processed foods are is that corn on the cob is unprocessed, canned corn is processed or minimally processed, and Doritos are ultra-processed. It's the big crunch with the big cheese taste. They don't look anything like corn. Mm -hmm. You would never know what was in them unless you read the ingredient list. And you can't eat just one, or maybe you can. I certainly can't. Well, tell me what happens in our bodies, if you can, when we are eating these highly processed foods. We don't really know. I mean, the one Hmm. clinically controlled study that has examined this question, I think one of the most important nutrition studies ever done, was the one that was done in in 2019 at NIH, where people were put in a controlled metabolic ward. They were given either ultra-processed food diet or a diet that was processed but not ultra-processed. The people who were eating the food couldn't tell the difference. They were matched in nutrient composition. And to the investigators' absolute surprise, when people were on the ultra-processed diet, they ate 500 calories a day on average more than they ate when they were on the other diet. 500 calories is a lot. Wow. It's a lot. Yep. It's a pound a week. And they gained a pound a week while they were on that diet without realizing that they were eating mm. more. So he's trying to figure out why. And the, yep. the first, uh, the most obvious thing was that they were eating more quickly. But he didn't, oh, th- interesting. he didn't think that that accounted for it enough. And so he's done the first study to examine it. And he said it's the hyper palatability, the fact that these people just love eating these foods and don't even mm. realize it. Um, and the calorie density, meaning the, that these are highly caloric products. Um, And we really like calories. And now he's doing further studies to try to figure out what's going on. But we don't really know the answer to that. All we know is that when people are 
given ultra processed foods, they eat a lot of them. Or, you know, as somebody explained to me, if you've got a bag of Oreo cookies in front of you, it's really hard to stop. When you, if you're eating a salad, there's a point at which you have enough salad. Mm -hmm. There's never a point at which you have enough Oreo cookies. And you're confronted with that all the time. You're confronted with, with billions and billions of dollars spent on advertising products that are not necessarily healthy. Um, Did you see the, the recent multi-billion dollar lettuce campaign? No, I did not. I, I didn't either. Exactly. <laughs> This dynamic is what led Nestle to develop her own niche in the nutrition field. She realized the issue wasn't just the food itself, but the food environment that we live in. And that environment is dominated by what she calls food politics. That's after the break. Have you ever wanted to learn more about the life story of our guests or wondered what other world-changing research was happening this week? Well, now we've got you covered. Subscribe to the new Big Brains Insider from the University of Chicago. The Insider is a bi-weekly email newsletter with exclusive content featuring expanded guest interviews, groundbreaking research we are following, and other fun behind-the-scenes content. If you love Big Brains, you'll love The Insider. Visit our website to opt in now at bigbrainspodcast.com. Big Brains is once again participating in the UChicago Giving Day, March 29th and 30th. Your contributions help us continue to highlight more pioneering researchers and the impact of their work that is reshaping our world. If you like the show, please consider supporting us. A link is on our website at bigbrainspodcast.com. In 2002, Nestle published the book that would define the future of her career, and it would change the way the world thought about the food industry. It was called Food Politics. Well, food politics is something I've been writing about for more than 20 years now. Everything about food is political. Everybody eats. Everybody buys right. food. It's an enormous industry composed of, of ag everything from agricultural production to transportation to retail sales uh, to restaurants to, you know, everything that you could think of connected with food. There's an enormous amount of money involved in it. And the purveyors of goods in that system want to make sure that their profits are maximized at all times. Um, and food companies are not social service agencies. They're not public health agencies. They're not non-for-profit organizations. They're businesses right. with, with stockholders. And they're a for-profit business. Their job is to give profits to stockholders as their absolute primary priority. They're not in the business of making people healthy. They're in the business yep. of selling products. And so if you are following Michael Pollan's basic dietary advice, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, um, nobody's making much of a profit off of that. The profits are off of junk foods. Those are the most profitable foods, foods that we're now calling ultra-processed, which are industrially yep. produced, can't be made in home kitchens, and we now know encourage people to eat more. And at one point you wrote, it appears as if the government and the food industry are collaborating to support a food environment that encourages people to eat more food than they need. And, and, and I wonder, if you think about what the government's role is, what is it, and, and, and how are they actually making it worse for us? Well, the government is involved in every aspect of, of food production and consumption that you can possibly think of, starting with agriculture and agricultural subsidies and where they go, and the fact that 90% of United States corn production has nothing to do with food for people. You know, half of it goes, half of that 90% goes to feed animals and the other half goes to fuel automobiles. Mm -hmm. That's our food system. That makes no sense whatsoever. You know, we're not producing food for people. We're producing food for animals and everything else is sort of minor in comparison. Um, that's agricultural policy. To me, it makes no sense whatsoever. Um, the government is involved in nutrition education 
through the dietary guidelines for Americans, which get longer and more complicated every year and confuse people enormously because they're focused mm-hmm. on details, not on the bigger picture. The government is involved in food labeling, which nobody understands. And nobody understood from the get-go because when the FDA tested models of food labels uh, in focus groups and other kinds of testing. Nobody understood any of the models they were using, and they picked the one that was least worst understood. Um, Mm. So there's basically no useful nutrition education in this country. There's no money going into nutrition education. The government does food safety. We could sure do a better job of that. Um, the government regulates advertising. We could sure do a lot better job of um, putting some restrictions on marketing of junk foods to kids, for example. And the tax policies allow food corporations to deduct the co- cost of marketing as a business expense. They're, they're not things that you usually think about. But the result of government policy is a food environment that, incur- that is very good for business. And not very good for public health. And I'd like to see that changed. It's been a long time coming, but government regulations are getting better. The FDA recently introduced a new rule that would crack down on super sugary cereal brands. Cereal may not be as healthy as you think. The FDA recently issued a proposed rule that updates criteria for claiming a food is healthy. And it takes aim at added sugars. You know, Fruit Loops, Fruity Pebbles, and Lucky Charms. Cereal seems a wise way to start the day with claims of whole grains, fiber, protein, heart healthy. But look closer and you may find a not so sweet secret. And what we'll find is a lot of America's favorite cereals, even those that they think are quote unquote healthy, will no longer cut um, or make that definition of healthy. And guess what? Those cereal brands aren't too happy. They claim their cereals are indeed healthy. I have a whole book on it. It's called Unsavory Truth, How Food Companies Skew the Science of What We Eat. Um, And it has to do with corporate funding of nutrition and food research. And this is where Nestle's work cuts close to home for our research-focused podcast. Her work has shown that in the game of food politics, scientists aren't always the neutral parties that they'd like to think of themselves as. The makers of any product that you can think of on the market are funding research in order to demonstrate that their product has some benefit for health or is safe or is benign or is whatever. And, you know, I on my blog, foodpolitics.com, every Monday I post one of these studies. Each one is funnier than the next because, <laughs> you know, I can, pr- I can predict from the title of a study who funded it or if I know who the funder is, I know what the results are going to be because they pay for what they get. And it's not that the people who are doing this research are bought in the most obvious sense. They're influenced but don't recognize the influence. Mm-hmm. There's, a great mm-hmm. de- there's a great deal of research on um, industry funding that shows that the recipients of industry funding really don't real- realize the ways in which they're being influenced um, on drug in drug industry funding demonstrates that the uh, drug that drug companies that fund basic medical research get the results they want, and and I find that in order to deal with food companies because I deal with food companies all the time. I have to go to an enormous effort to think in every dealing with a food company, am I putting myself in a position where my integrity is going to be compromised or in which my thinking is going to be influenced? And it's hard. It's not easy to do that. But it's a, just by the most remarkable coincidence, the studies that are industry funded almost always come out in favor of the funder's interest. And I get letters all the time from uh, food corporations or from trade groups saying we've got this amount of money and we're looking for studies that demonstrate the benefits of our product. Well, they're not going to fund anything that's not likely to show a benefit. 
Right. That's where that that's where the bias comes in. So, you know, you can design a study to demonstrate benefit and you're giving the funder exactly what the funder wants and your study comes out exactly the way the funder wants it. I think this is very unfortunate. You know, a lot yep. of this has to do with the lack of government funding, but also I think because people just don't realize that this is about marketing, not science. But even if we did manage to have better research into the food that we eat, how much would actually change? Most people know to eat more whole foods, mostly fruits and vegetables. The problem is what they eat in between. Changing the politics of our food environment, well, that's complicated. No, I think there are two things that would be very useful. One would be to repeal the Supreme Court's decision on Citizens United, which allows corporations to put as much money as they want into election campaigns um, without having to disclose the amounts that they're doing. Um, you know, we need a publicly funded election system so that people who care about public health can run for office without getting corrupted. Um, you know, right now we have a, co a corporate controlled election system because they've got the money. Um, so that's one. And then the second one, I think, is we have to change Wall Street. Uh, the way that Wall Street evaluates corporations is by how much money they make for their stockholders. Uh, there have been some attempts by business leaders to try to say social values need to be incorporated into corporate activities and corporations need to be evaluated on what they're doing for the environment and what they're doing for public health. But until Wall Street changes the way it evaluates corporations based on those kinds of values, they can't budge. They can do lip service to it. And a lot of corporations are doing lip service to environmental protection, but it's not real. So these are big system changes that need to be done. How do we do that? We need to change our government. You know, when students ask me what can they do, I tell them run for office. You either have to develop grassroots power or you have to develop top-down power. I think we need both. The latest solution being put forward today doesn't so much look at these systemic changes. Rather, it promises to fix everything with just a simple little drug. Oh! 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 Ozempic. 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 Ozempic, a popular medication typically prescribed for people with type 2 diabetes, is reportedly being used off label for weight loss by social media users. This question, I had to ask what this was earlier, mm -hmm. but how does WeGovi help you lose weight? I guess we start with what is WeGovi? Yeah, I love this. The weight loss drug, WeGovi, also made by Nova Nordisk, is FDA approved for weight loss. These drugs have become famous for their seemingly miraculous ability to help patients lose weight. A new crop of anti-obesity drugs are proving remarkably effective, cutting body weight by an average 15 to 22 percent. These medicines, including Ozempic and WeGovi, could trigger a shift in how doctors treat this. There's a lot of discussions these days about different drugs, i.e. Ozempic, um, which was developed to help people with diabetes, but, but is now actually not uh, uncommonly surprised to help people lose weight. How do you feel about this approach? And if we can't manage the obesity issue through the food we're consuming and the changes in the companies, is handling it pharmacologically an option in your mind and a good option? You know, from a health promotion, public health standpoint, you want to prevent um, type 2 diabetes. If you want to prevent type 2 diabetes, what you want to prevent is weight gain, because weight gain is so closely associated with type 2 diabetes. It's not that everybody who is overweight gets type 2 diabetes, but if you look at people with type 2 diabetes, roughly 90% of them are overweight. Um, by the usual standards, because we live in an environment in which we're supposed to eat more, not less. So, so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, I don't treat children and adults who have obesity. I'm not somebody who does that, but I hear from people who do treat, and they are happy to have a tool at long last that might actually do some good. I'm not, I'm not going to argue that. I'm just, you know, from my standpoint, I, th I think in public health terms. 
I'm a public right. health person. I, I think we really need public policy. Um, we need government action. We need everybody to try to figure out what to do about obesity. It should be a source of enormous concern, and the government should be funding all kinds of studies to try to figure out some effective way for making it easier for people to eat more healthfully. So that's on the pessimistic side. Okay. Um, I don't see that happening. On the optimistic side, I teach students, you know, and I get to deal with young people who are interested in food and who want to use food to change the world for the better. Um, you know, they're interested in studying about food. We have food studies programs in my department at NYU, and the students who come into that at the undergraduate master's or doctoral level want to change the world using food as a means to do that. And because food connects to absolutely every problem in society in one way or another, they have the opportunity to do that. And, you know, I want to encourage them in every way I can. Final question, if I can. I'm going to follow you into a supermarket. What am I going to find about how you're shopping, what you're putting in your cart? You know, I try to have I try to have a shopping list and shop with blinders on so I don't get hooked by the things that are being pushed at me. I read food labels mainly because they're so entertaining. I mean, I just I just love reading food labels. What are they doing now? And I look at them with a very skeptical molecular biology lens. Um, I mean, I find supermarkets just more fun than anything. And healthy diets don't necessarily have to be more expensive. They could be just as delicious. You don't have to give up the pleasure of food to eat healthfully. Um, and it's better for kids. It's better for adults. It's better for old people. It's better for everybody. If you're getting a lot out of the important research shared on Big Brains, there's another University of Chicago Podcast Network show you should check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories, not through opinions and anecdotes, but through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. If you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. Big Brains is a production of the UChicago Podcast Network. If you like what you heard, please give us a review and a rating. The show is hosted by Paul M. Rand and produced by me, Matt Hodap, with assistance from Alyssa Eads. Thanks for listening.